Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the general question series, and it is a question and answer session from people in Kentucky. Presented by Jesus on the 7th of September 2013 in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia. This is part one. So how's everyone today? <laughs> Mary's not with me today, so um, she's feeling some things that she needs to feel, so that's good. But uh, welcome today. By the way, I just wanted to compliment you on the group last week. It was really open and everyone seemed to want to participate and it was really good, actually. Uh, myself and Mary enjoyed ourselves a lot, actually. It's, when, it, when there's a group like that, it's a bit of a breeze to present. When there's a group that's all like rigid and hard and not wanting to hear anything, it gets a bit more difficult. Okay, well, I'm yours for three or four hours. What, what, do, you... <laughs> what do, would you like to know? <laughs> Can we start with Teresa here and then we'll go out the back to Eloisa? Thank you. Um, um, I have a bit of a conflict at the moment. It's around um, money stuff, bankruptcy, um, and the ethics of it. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we're going through a process of seeing if we should go bankrupt or not. Yeah. Um, but I don't feel comfortable with it because I feel like it's cheating in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, it's like avoiding my responsibilities around it. But then my conflict is, um, is that just me punishing myself? So when I think about it, I think, no, I should pay all these people back and stuff because some of them aren't. Bankruptcy won't fix some of them anyway. Mm. Um, and it's, yeah, I'm just trying to work out what the ethics and the morals around what the loving things are yeah. to do around it. Well, firstly, Teresa, bankruptcy begins, and if we, if we now, if we expand the question a little, because I'd like to talk a little bit about money generally as well in the question. If you look, if you look at our Western society, we are very focused on money, aren't we? If you, for the majority of us, we either feel like, we usually feel we haven't got enough, <laughs> And those of us who do, who do have enough generally don't like sharing it very much either. So there, there are issues regarding money that we have that, or, that are really emotional in their nature. So whenever we're faced with not having enough money and going bankrupt, um, we're, we're basically not examining the fact that it's due to our previous actions that we have taken, not our actions right now. Does that make sense? So it's your actions that you've taken historically that have caused you to go bankrupt now. And this is something that we need to, or, or feel like you need to go bankrupt now. This is something we need to address. We need to understand that everything we create today has an effect tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. It has an effect on our future. And when we choose to take actions that are not responsible today, then it's going to have an effect on our future. Now, if we rewind, so if we look at your condition today and say, OK, we're worried that we're not going to have enough money to pay the bills, basically that's the problem, that was caused by your past decisions. And the question then becomes, well, what emotions drove those past decisions? Why have you made choices to spend more than you had or that you had the capacity to repay? Now, that is driven by emotions every single time. Whatever causes you to not have the capacity to repay something is driven by an emotion right at that moment. And that emotion is immoral in its nature because it's not taking responsibility. Therefore, it's unethical. You should only engage processes that you know you will be able to repay. 
But here in Western society, we are so driven by this desire to have things that we start to overextend ourselves. In other words, we, we want to have things, but we don't have the capacity to pay for the things that we have. And this is our primary issue when it comes to issues of bankruptcy. If you address the cause of that, then it's highly likely you'll get out of any um, financial hardship you're in and not have to declare bankruptcy at all. But if you do not address the cause of that, then what will happen is you'll definitely go bankrupt, but then you possibly go bankrupt again. And in fact, what they've found through studies is that the majority of people who go bankrupt once finish up going bankrupt two, three, four, five times in their lifetime. And the main reason why that happens is because there is this underlying emotional thing driving trying to have more and, and purchase more than you can pay for. So the real question becomes, why have you purchased more than you can pay for? Do you know what emotional reasons have driven that? What's driven that? Um, you, we've, we've talked about this in the past and it's to do with the fear in me about my, well, my parents' fear that it put on me. But I, I, don't, feel, I don't agree. Yeah, there's, there's, um, I'm af afraid of my husband's emotions around some of the stuff. So in other words, he purchases things that he doesn't have the funds to pay for? Yes, and but I mean, I do it too. Yes. Um, I feel like the world owes me. Yeah, that's more the emotion. Yeah. The um, feeling that the world owes you. Yeah. And, and your husband must have the same feeling. Okay. Otherwise, he wouldn't, he wouldn't purchase more than he could pay for either. Yeah. yeah. And if both of you have the same... See, normally in a family, one has the, that feeling yeah. and the other one has oftentimes the opposite feeling because that sometimes is what the law of attraction brings you. And so you end up at least surviving. Yeah. <laughs> but, but when both of you have the same feeling, yeah, it gets pretty difficult. It, it has exacerbated since we got together, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know I've had it all my life, but it got So worse. before you were married... Yep. To your husband, did you find did you find that you were always having a shortfall of funds? I was managing it. You were managing it, but yeah. when you say managing it, uh, was um, there always a flow? But you were always short. I was just having enough to get by on, and without getting the necessities, and occasionally I'd go into debt, but I'd be able to sort it out. Sort it out. Yeah. 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 Um, see, I would suggest that. The problem was there before you met yeah, your husband, obviously, yeah, and yeah. you've now attracted another person who does the same thing as you, mm. and both of you don't check each other with it, and you both don't discuss it together as to what you're purchasing and so forth. And so in the end, what, what, we, what you end up with is spending more than you can pay for. Yeah, and it's chaotic yeah. and, yeah. Now, it's driven, as you've identified, from an emotion of rage, actually, from, of anger. Mm -hmm that the world should provide me with everything I want. Yep. And when you don't have the means to pay for it, you think the world should take the fall for that. Yeah. And that, that emotion is the emotion that needs to... That's where I'd begin, with that emotion. And I would work through that emotion into the fear of, that's underneath that emotion. So it starts with that anger. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the anger is a demand upon the world to look after you. In other words, a demand that you, don't, you shouldn't have to take personal responsibility for your choices and decisions. Okay. And in a way, bankruptcy is a way to not take personal responsibility yeah. for your choices and decisions. Yeah. Now, it is a big problem in the planet. If you, you look at very, very large companies, most very, very large companies do this eventually, where they get so large and very poorly managed sometimes... And you see them go broke and they've got, you know, 30, 40, 100,000 employees and they've all lost a job. And oftentimes it was due to the same feeling. And then they expect the government to bail them out. Mm. Most governments run like this. If you look at the US government at the moment, I think it's in something like 16 or $17 trillion worth of debt. Um, and and the, the Constitution stated at one point that it should only ever get into $5 trillion as a maximum. <laughs> and, it's, and it's like it's already three times that amount of debt. Yeah. And so yeah, the Australian government, of course, is running in debt rather than in surplus um, with their funds. And so basically it's a problem worldwide, isn't it, in, in terms of all of the Western world seems to want to do it. And we all 
have so that there's an indication of how much anger there is in most people that other people should take responsibility for the decisions you make. Mm. Even things like uh, public uh, so social programs like uh, ha unemployment, living, living on unemployment and things like that, often that is also a demand upon the environment to give you what you want. And so all of these are very angry emotions. Now, there's only two ways that these emotions got created. One way is that when you were young, you never got anything. And then you feel like you should get anything, you should get things when you grow up as an adult. And the other way is that when you were young, you were given everything you wanted without any responsibility. And, and then when you grow up, you start demanding that everybody else around you gives you everything you want without you taking any personal responsibility. Mm. And they're the two primary emotions that drive uh, a lack of responsibility with finances. Now, they're not the emotions that create a lack of finances, right? Because there are other emotions again. So there are emotions associated with worth, in other words, what, whether, whether you feel you're worthy and things like that. But the, the feeling that you have inside of you is that you should be able to go and get anything you want at any time you want and you'll worry about paying for it later, mm. right? And the reality is a lot of people in the world have exactly, particularly in the Western world, have exactly the same uh, concept. It's not a loving concept. It's not a moral concept. It's not ethical. Yeah. But, but once we engage it for uh, over long periods of time, we eventually end up in so severe a debt that then we're thinking about bankruptcy. So what I would be doing is not focusing on the bankruptcy issue. I'd be focusing on what created the circumstances to get you into this place. Does that make sense? And if you're sincere about addressing the causes, then you'll want to address the emotions that caused you to make these decisions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't address those causal emotions, then you'll possibly go bankrupt. But at some point in the future, you'll probably, it'll yeah. probably happen again or you'll be in the same cycle unless you address this emotionally at some point. And that's the same with any emotion that you have that's out of harmony with love. Sooner or later, if you don't address it, it's going to come and rear its head again and again and again and again and again throughout your life. There's not much you're going to be able to do about that unless you choose to actually address the emotion that's created it. So I would start with the anger you feel, the expectation that other people look after you, that they give you what you want and that you shouldn't have to take personal responsibility and then ask yourself where those emotions came from. Did it come from a, sense, a feeling of lack in your childhood or did it come from being given everything you wanted and without any responsibility for, for those things? In, in other words, without any responsibility that, that you had to create such things for yourself. Mm. Okay. So which one did it come from yeah, for it was you? From, from the lack. From the lack? Yeah. I, I think, well, I think so. I'd... You have to be very careful, Teresa, in the way that you analyse this. Because... If you look at the rest of your family, your extended family, they don't seem to have as much lack as you do. So Now, but in our childhood... I have a resistance to feeling that I might have had everything I asked for. I'm not saying you had everything you asked for in your childhood, yeah. but what I'm saying is you've got to be very careful in your analysis mm. of this problem because, because, because you are projecting at the world so much rage about the world having to pay, to give, pay your way that you're not in a state where you can clearly think about your childhood issues at this point in time. This is where what I'm saying is you need to start with the rage, yeah. see that the rage is actually unloving, unethical and immoral, <laughs> and then work your way back from there rather than trying to guess what your childhood was like because at the moment I feel you're not accurately assessing your childhood and what it was like with regard to the money um, because it, it can be one of these two issues but the problem for you is you're going to try to blame it on someone else in your current state. Mm. In your current state you're already blaming it on somebody else, you're blaming it on the world, right? And so you, you, you're going to look back at your childhood and have a temptation to now blame it on your parents. Mm -hmm. And that isn't going to be conducive to your healing the emotional problem of taking self-responsibility for your actions. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this is where you've got to be very careful. 
Yeah. Because you, you blame it on other, on other people, but you've got to, at some point, see that this is caused by your decisions, your, your choice yeah. to want more and more and more that you cannot afford. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And at some point in time, you've got to see that and, and take some responsibility for that. Because if you don't take responsibility for that, you'll be tempted to then go and blame your husband or blame... You know, the fact that you had children that are like that or blame the fact that you're brought up with nothing and, or blame the world itself mm. or blame something. But, but all that anger is, is covering over a lot of fear and grief that you need to obviously feel to heal the issue. But, but if, you, if you keep blaming everybody else, you're not going to be taking any personal responsibility. And you, there's a desperate need for you to take personal responsibility. In fact, if you took personal responsibility for every single debt, you would find that you would have a lot of assistance to actually uh, overcome the debt, yeah. right? But the reality is if you don't take personal responsibility for all of the debt that you've created, then, then a lot of people will, will push yeah. pretty hard to... Yeah, I've noticed that. Yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, it's unethical for you to even make the statement, even if I pay back what I can pay back, the uh, people are not going to be satisfied. That statement itself is unethical. At the beginning of the question, you made some unethical statements, not understanding that your attitude towards other people mm. is such that if they have money, then they should give you some. Or they should allow you to get away with the debt. And that's not an ethical position. It's not a moral position either. I see a lot of people who don't have a lot of funds have that attitude. I've met many rich people who have a very good attitude to ethics when it comes to money. They always pay their debts. And I've met many poor people who think they should always get away with paying their debts. Mm. And that's an unethical attitude. And it's one reason why they don't have enough money. Because the, the money they do have, they're using unethically and immorally. In other words, they're expecting other people to pay for things that they should be personally responsible for. And when you're unethical and immoral, God's laws are always going to try to correct that. And so God's laws are going to, going through the law of attraction, you're going to create a poor, a poor situation and that comes up as, and challenges your compromise of your morals. Does that make sense? Yeah. So taking action to confront all of these debts that I've got. Um, will bring up some of the emotion. Yeah. Because some of the emotion you'll start feeling is, why should I have to do that? They've yeah. got plenty of money and yeah. I've got none. And yeah. Why should I have to pay that, you know? Uh, that person's got plenty of month funds and I haven't got as much, you know? Mm. They've got more than I have, so why should I have to pay that back and yeah. all that kind of thing? So, so I've been doing that. Yeah. But um, perhaps I haven't been doing that as much. Well, I would, I would I actually, if it was me, I would write down every single debt I had. Yeah. I'd write down how much every single debt is. I would t total all up and, and, and then sit with the shock of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been doing that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then what I would do is I'd approach every single person with some kind of a payment plan. I would get rid of every single credit card. I would get, you know, so yeah. that I can't go and do the same thing again. Yeah. Um, I, there was a lot of personal choices I would choose to, to make if I was in the situation. You're not choosing those things. Because there is an, a feeling in you yeah. emotionally and a feeling in your husband emotionally that, that you should be able to get away with some of it. Mm. And while you have that feeling, God's laws are going to be trying to correct that feeling because it's not ethical. Yeah. 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 So it's very important for anybody who has any debt to, to have a good look at their situation, their personal situation. If you, if you can't afford to pay it back... Um, then you should stop incurring more. <laughs> and you should look at the underlying emotional reasons why in the past you have made choices which caused you to think that you should be able to go out and buy new things all the time and incur more debt without there being any sense of responsibility. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Thanks. So to me, the issue, the, the, the real question that you asked, which is not the answer that you probably expected <laughs> that I gave, is about, is about going bankrupt. What's ethical in terms of going bankrupt? Can you see if you, had, if you address the issues the way I'm suggesting, you would never get that question to have to be asked. Yeah. 
unless there was some unusual circumstances such as your house burning down or, you know, some unusual circumstances that might have occurred that might cause that particular problem. But, but it wouldn't be caused by just a, a choice of consumption. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm suggesting to you that if you're getting to the place where this is a question, then it means that there's a lot of unethical and immoral behaviour that, it's, that it has, has been taken before this point that have, has not been corrected and there, is, and there is a resistance to correcting it mm. inside of you. And that's why this point eventually becomes so severe that you're considering bankruptcy. Yeah. And at that point, my suggestion is choose differently, choose to get into some of these emotions, choose to try to resolve the issue without bankruptcy. And, but if bankruptcy is forced upon you by someone, then of course you will yeah. need to go through it. But... but you want to try to avoid that by taking responsibility for everything that you have purchased in the past and what you've done. Mm. And, and usually, if a person chooses along those lines, they get assistance to do so. Yeah, we've noticed that already. Yeah. Yeah. And if they don't choose to go along those lines, yeah. they'll get a lot of uh, quite angry people wanting them to, take, <laughs> to clean, clean them out, as the saying goes. Uh, and that is, again, the law of attraction at work. Mm. When we refuse to take personal responsibility for our own actions and decisions from the past, then we surely should, be at, should expect other people to demand of us that we take some responsibility for what we've done in mm. the past. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And in fact, for other people to allow us to do it would not be them loving us at all. Mm. So if other people allowed us to get away with incurring a heap of debt... Uh, without taking any action uh, to, to resolve the problem, then they wouldn't be a loving us even. Yeah, I've, I've got that situation as well, mm. which I'm, I, I do blame that other person as well for that, I know, but, yeah. which doesn't help. No. Yeah. So you, you have people around you who would, can help you out of the debt, but the reality is why should they help you out of the debt when it's been a problem all the way through your life? Mm. You're not taking responsibility. Your husband's not taking responsibility for his purchases either. Can you see that it wouldn't be a very loving thing for them to give you more funds only for you to go out and spend them and still have a problem of not paying all of your debt? Yeah. <laughs> you know, in the end, unless you cure the emotional reason why it happens, this is going to be an ongoing problem for a lot of your life. Mm. Yeah. What I find too, uh, just a general comment to everyone, what I find too is that people who are in a large amount of debt or have a large amount of uh, expenses generally have no desire whatsoever to either curtail them or to actually know their true financial position. Mm. Now, if you truly love yourself, you will at every moment know your true financial position. At every moment. You won't have to wait to the end of the year till the accountant tells you what your true financial position is. You will know every month, every week, what your true financial position is, what you can afford to pay and what you can't afford to do. You will know it. And as you work through the emotions surrounding money, your financial position should improve. But part of working through these emotions about money are all going to be associated with taking personal responsibility for your life. And that's where a lot of people fall short. Mm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any more questions about that issue? Or No? Okay, let's go on. Um, well, who was next? It was Eloisa, wasn't it? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, AJ, I just wanted to ask you about some um, childhood abuse issues. Mm -hmm. um, I began opening up to them and I've got to a point where I'm kind of blocked mm -hmm. and I'm suspecting that there's quite a lot of spirit influence and that I could have been quite out of body because I can only remember from my waist down and I've only got kind of images of it rather than um, a lot of the feelings associated with it. Um, I am feeling that I've obviously got quite a lot of terror around this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know what my question is, but I just was wondering if you could maybe give me some pointers. Isn't your direction. question about being blocked pr primarily yeah, to it? Yeah, about being yep. blocked. Okay, well, the main reason why we're ever blocked is because we're terrified. And we're unwilling to experience the terror. Okay. Okay, so, so the first thing you need to allow yourself to feel is the unwillingness okay. to feel the terror. 
So, um, and that means just writing down all the reasons why you think you shouldn't have to do it. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Yep. Now, a lot of those reasons, when we've been abused generally, a lot of those reasons surround the fact that other people did it to us and we don't feel that we should have to deal with it. We feel they should have to deal with it. Now, unfortunately, though, the only problem with that kind of uh, idea or concept is the emotions are within us. The, the emotions. In, so if I'm looking at it from my personal perspective, the emotions are in me. If I expect you to fix it, there is no way in the end, no matter how sorry you are for what you may have done, there is no way in the end that you can fix it because the emotions about it are in me. And I have total control over my own emotions. There's nothing, nobody else that has total control over my own emotions other than myself. So, so again, it's probably an issue of looking at personal responsibility. Yeah. And, and also love of yourself. And one of the things that, if I go back to Teresa's issue with regard to the finance, if you truly love yourself, you would not overextend yourself. If you truly loved yourself, you wouldn't do it. Does that make sense? You'd know at every moment what your financial position is. You'd know at every moment what you would choose to spend and how wise the decision you're making is in terms of your own sense of love of yourself. If you truly loved another, you wouldn't do it either, right? Because you wouldn't expect somebody else to take responsibility for your life. So they, they, are, they are issues of love. Now, if we come back to this situation with regard to feeling about abuse issues, in a lot of ways, there are similar issues of love of self involved because when you truly love yourself, you're willing to feel all of your own emotions when you really love yourself. So if you're not feeling all of your own emotions yet, part of the issue is the lack of love of self. Okay. Does that make sense? Now, of course, spirits around you will want to influence you to not love yourself. Because it's happening heaps. Yep, and you know that that's frequently occurring still. But, but if you make choices yourself to not love yourself, and one choice is to not feel your own feelings, that is a choice to not love yourself. And if you make choices to not love yourself, how can you expect other people to love you? Yeah, I can't. You can't really expect other people to love you if you're already making choices to not love yourself. So, so now we've identified two issues here. One, firstly, is the terror, the unwillingness to feel the terror. And the unwillingness to feel the terror is also related to a lack of love of yourself. Does that make sense? Because if you truly loved yourself, you would choose to feel the terror. Yeah. And, and whenever you get stuck, it's because you're choosing to not feel the terror. And that means in that moment, you're choosing to not love yourself. But you don't see that as a link. Most people who have been abused don't link those two things together. What they do is this inside of themselves instead. They go, I'm loving myself by not feeling the terror. <laughs> yeah. That's what they think. Because it keeps me safe. No, that... no, but that's not true. You see, while the terror is in you, your law of attraction, <laughs> the, the law of attraction itself is going to be attracted, vents are going to be attracted to trigger your terror. So what you're going to do while the terror is in you is you're going to attract events that actually make you feel more unsafe. Yeah. So, so you're not even being honest with yourself if you think that not feeling your fear makes you safer. Yeah, but am I saying, is that what I'm saying to myself? Of course you're yeah, saying yeah, that, yeah. but it's not true. Yeah, and, right? I'm, and I'm beginning to see that. It's yeah. pretty yucky. The reality is most people who have been abused finish up having some kind of sexual trauma later in their life. Why does that happen? Because they're unwilling to feel the trauma itself and unwilling to feel the emotions that the trauma of their childhood triggered. And as a result, the emotions within them cause attractions where other people notice that they are people who've been abused and therefore probably open to being abused again. And then, of course, people who are predators decide to manipulate that situation to to harm the person even in their adult life. So the reality is while you're holding on to this traumatic abuse from childhood, you're actually making your adult life more unsafe than yeah. safe. 
Yeah. Right? And this is something we also need to understand. You see, a lot of the times when it comes to abuse, we're telling ourselves, as long as I can stay away from the fear, I'll be safe. As long as I stay away from you know, this situation or that situation, I'll be safe. Not true. While the fear and other emotions within you about your sexual trauma from your childhood remain within you, the law of attraction is going to work and that's going to pull to you other people who abuse the situation. In other words, they realise there are people who are predators who can tell that person's been abused, that person has not. That person's been abused, that person has not. And they can tell that if they attack a person who's been abused, most of the time they'll get away with it. Right? This is how child, you know, like pedophiles work, don't they? They attack children who they know, the parents or the child themselves, will enter a situation where they feel they'll be able to get away with it. <laughs> what do I do? What has happened? Because I don't know whether it's no, no. or not, or whether it's me. Just stop. Just stop. Stop and breathe. Stop. You're trying to go away and you're just getting overcloaked straight away. No, just so stop and breathe. 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 The subject matter is matter that you're not addressing emotionally and you try to get away. And you need to just stay present and breathe. Does that make sense? Stay present and breathe. Breathe. All right. No, no, you're allowed to go outside and have a cry. That's fine. But whenever you go into this very panicky place, right, you, it is because you are trying to get away from the experience, not because you're having one. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Exactly. No, there's a number of people in the audience who have been abused sexually, and this material applies to all of them, right? But. What happened just there was you did not want to feel your grief and so that then allows a spirit to, to go over you. Does that make sense? To overcome you. I have spirits like all, all the, time. the time. You yes. know that. And there's addictions to the spirits. and Yeah, if you hold the mic up a bit closer so I can hear you probably. I'll just breathe. <laughs> um. So yesterday when I got into the car with Dave... Yeah, I don't want to go over any experiences with you okay. because you, what you're going to find is that okay. you want to tell me stories and the reason why you want to tell me stories is you do not want to feel certain things. The reason why spirits are with you all the time is because you do not want to feel. But I've tried. No, you haven't. I'm sorry. You don't think... No. ..that that eight-year-old experience that came through in July was me? And my experience? No, what I'm saying is you're, you're trying to avoid your grief and terror. Your grief and terror, your emotions. You're trying to avoid them all the time. And this causes spirits to be with you all the time, helping you avoid your own emotions. It's so hard. It is so hard. I'm trying everything I can. I've read all of your booklets in the last four <laughs> weeks. And I have worked so hard every day since I met you. Yeah, but I'm saying to you that you want these spirits with you. You want them with you. Right? Yeah, I know, because I'm so freaked out of myself. That no, I'm not it's not. And... It's because you're unwilling to feel your terror. You, you say it's because I'm freaked out. No, that's not the justification. You're freaked out, I agree. Every single person who's ever had any sexual abuse in their childhood generally gets very frightened of addressing the issue. I agree with that. But you don't want to feel how frightened you are. That's your problem. You don't want to feel it. See, if you wanted to feel it, then you would be able to feel it without being overcloaked by spirits all the time. How do you tell if you're overcloaked by spirits? Well, because you, it, it, you just thought, gave an example of it. But, but what I thought when I didn't even know at eight. No, but you just gave an example of it. Your question was, how do I know? You just showed yourself how you know. Whenever you respond like that, you're way, you're way away from yourself. Okay. Yeah, and Does I, that make I sense? was dissociated at the time, of course. Yeah, you need to hold the microphone right up higher. Don't even want to talk about it. Okay, well, hand the microphone back to Eloisa and I'll talk to her. But, but if you're going to do what you just did, you're going away from your fear. You're not, you're not actually in your fear. 
no, you said you didn't want to talk about it. And that's okay, so sit down and we'll talk to Eloisa. Because <laughs> there's someone who does want to deal with her fear. So I want to talk to her about it. So the key thing with regard to fear is that you sit and own it. You feel it. You don't want to run away from it all the time. That's the key thing. Now, when you go away from your body and you run away from your fear, that's when you get a lot of heavy spirit influence. That's when other spirits, and sometimes there's two groups of spirits. There's a group of spirits who have been abused themselves, who surround you, and they are going, no, don't feel anything, don't feel anything, because that's how they feel. Don't feel anything, don't feel anything, don't you feel anything. And so that group of spirits surround you, and that group of spirits is saying to you, don't feel anything, don't feel anything. Then you also have a group of spirits around you who have been abusers or pedophiles in the past. And they go, you beauty, this person doesn't want to feel anything, now's my opportunity to attack them in some way, whether that be sexually or physically in terms of violence. And often the two spirits surrounding you, the two groups of spirits surrounding you, are actually in a bit of a battle with each other even. <laughs> Does that make sense? But all of that would go away if there was a willingness to feel the terror. Okay. And this is where our primary problem is on earth. We don't believe that we are capable of experiencing our terror. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's our belief. That's our primary belief. That's the thing we need to pray about. Okay. So, pray, just to reiterate what you're saying so I'm getting it is just to pray about how much I don't want to and how much I believe I can't and like start there and just ask <laughs> to be shown that I can or I don't know for some courage or pointers on what to well do. yeah I haven't finished yet but Sorry, I, I'll summarize it at the end okay. for you, <laughs> you. so number one is understand that every time you get stagnant every time you have tuned out You've tuned out because you're terrified. So that's number one. So honour that. Does that make sense? Honour that by feeling that. Yeah. And when you say feeling that, just own that I'm terrified. Just own that you're terrified. I'm, I'm, and say to yourself, look, like I'm numb and I'm stagnant and I'm not feeling anything today and that's because I'm terrified. Yep. Well, can I just add a little... I'm noticing, like... When I engage sexually with Pete, that it's beginning to happen. It's like before I was just totally numb and not noticing. And yeah. now I'm noticing just how before, like, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, cool, let's do it. And then it's like, I, I said to Pete, like, I was like, I can't, like, I'm just already clamping up. Like, yep. I'm already disappearing, you know? Yeah. And in the past, I've just got, gone through it and then felt bad afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> And now it's just like, I think that's terror. Like, that's right. I think that's showing me that this somehow is terrifying. Yep. So, so that's the first thing, a knowledge that you're terrified. Okay. You, you, you will find for most people who abuse, they very rarely, if ever, acknowledge their own terror. Yep. Right? And the problem with not acknowledging your own terror is that, is that you usually, every time you feel the potential for terror, you try to get away from yourself. And as soon as you get away from yourself, some spirits come in, influence your life in some way. In, in some cases, they overcloak you completely. Does that make sense? And so you need to see that the reason why these spirits are overcloaking you completely under those circumstances, if that's happening, is because you don't want to acknowledge or feel your terror. That's always because of that. All right? So that's number one. So the question then also, uh, uh, there are parts of that associated to that, and that is, what are your beliefs about terror? All right. yeah. Now, the average person on the earth believes that terror should be something they never have to experience. Right? Yeah. They believe that it's impossible to experience it and survive. Yeah. Right? They believe that you shouldn't have to experience it. Right? So there's often an anger associated with experiencing it and feel we shouldn't have to. And we feel that the person who created it should be punished for it. Yeah. Right? And so those belief systems generally cause us, as soon as we start to feel any terror, 
they cause us to revert to either anger yeah. or total tune out, total yeah. zone out. We do one or the two, right? We either go and get really, really angry or we tune out. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Now, we need to acknowledge that we have terror, but we also, and this is, so this is point number two, we need to see what our justifications of holding on to terror are. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. What, what do we tell ourselves so that we hold on to being terrified? What, what are the messages we give ourselves all the time? So you'd give yourself some messages, wouldn't you, Eloise? Yeah. Can you, can you recognise them? Um, I'm just trying to think because I think I've done them for so long that they're like auto. Yeah, most of them will be automatic for, the, per, for a person who's been abused. Generally, um, avoiding terror became the very first priority at their, in their childhood yeah. and therefore they are usually adept at it. <laughs> yeah. Right? They are like, you know, they are the most experienced people generally on the planet of how to get away with not feeling terror, yeah. right? Well, that's how I feel, and it's like now I'm just like having to relearn how to feel everything, you know? I For agree. the first time having to feel everything. Yep. So to answer your question, I think what I do is I do something else immediately. So, so right, try to keep yourself busy doing something. Yeah, and I get real busy. So, so, so those of you who have been abused, how many of you use that one? Right, so, yeah, keep yourself busy. That way you don't have to feel about it. Yep. Right? Distract. Thanks. Distract yourself, yes? Do something else or um, yeah, minimise, like, go, oh, oh, it's just a movie. Or, oh, it's just a... Oh, it was, and, okay, it's like... It's so you're feeling violent. really, really terrified and you were triggered by, say, a movie that you were yep. watching and some kind of situation in the movie and then you're going, oh, but it's just a movie, it's just a movie, I'm yeah. okay. <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah, instead yeah, I'm of just, fine, I'm fine. yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, no um, or um, subsequent events attracted um, after the abuse that were pretty abusive. Um, yeah. Just saying, oh, it didn't matter. It was my fault. Um, blame yourself. Yeah. So this is a big thing most of you victims do. Yeah. Is they learn to blame themselves when anything goes wrong, and it's actually a way of avoiding terror. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, eat. Eat, yeah. yeah. So f should we call all of those things physical addictions? Yeah. So many abuse victims either go into some kind of physical addiction like eating, drugs, drink, um, so alcohol or some kind of uh, thing like that, or they avoid them intensely. Yeah. So they go the opposite direction where they want total control of everything in yeah. every situation. And whenever they haven't got total control, that's it. They're out the door. Yep. Definitely. Okay. Um, emotional ways will be angry or get angry rather than... So when you get terrified, there's a desire to just get in an anger, anger with anybody who triggered you or whatever triggered yep. you. Um, yep. Yeah, um, I'm beginning now to, to be where you said, like, blame my brother rather than um, myself and the rage is at him now. But yep. it's more... Yeah, no, a self-attack. I was going to say just blaming others, like, you know, sort of taking it out on someone else to avoid it. And in the end, blaming others, by the way, oh, uh, while it's an improvement on blaming yourself, <laughs> <It's the same laughs> um, <thing. laughs> at the end of the day, it still doesn't really help get to your grief. Does no, that make sense? I've discovered that. Yeah, so, so, so uh, there are many people in the spirit world who have passed over into the spirit world who have been abused on earth and they've blamed other people so much that they've become murderous mm. or murderers in the spirit world. What they do to do that is they overcoat people on earth and who they hate, who are like the person who hurt them, and they just drive them nuts until they kill themselves or something like mm. that. And, and that is caused by still they, they're now blaming the person. They're not blaming themselves anymore. Uh, so, so it's good that they're not blaming themselves, but in blaming the person they're still not accessing the terror and the grief. No. Right? It's still a way of avoiding the terror and the grief in the end. And also, I mean, for me, it's like, you know, I have felt real angry, but I wouldn't, like, though sometimes I have wished something bad would happen, I'd feel so bad if something happened to them anyway that I'd be, like, terrified of what would happen to me. Well, <laughs> okay. this is another thing too, though, is that many times people who've been abused 
feel a sense of guilt about their feelings associated with the abuser. Right? Whether that feeling might be that they loved them or that they wouldn't want them hurt or and a number of other things like that. But th those feelings are still an avoidance of your own emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But, but most abusers have learnt to teach, they teach people they abuse these emotions. They actively teach them. So, so they say things like, for example, like, you know, don't you tell anyone it's our little secret. If you tell somebody, then I'll tell them that you wanted it. And you did really want that anyway, didn't you? You know, and all these kind of things. And they, and they drum that into the child generally to such an extent that the child finishes up feeling like the child was the main reason why the abuse occurred. Right? And this is why self-blame is so damaging with regard to abuse. It's a great way of avoiding grief and fear but also what it does is it basically says, I'm to blame for what somebody else did to me. Right? And it's not true, of course. You're not to blame. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, can't, I don't know if anyone else has got ideas about... No, that's, so they're good. So, so the first thing we said was, you're terrified. Yeah. The second thing we've said now... So maybe I'll write them down, shall I? Thank you. Okay. Great. So the first thing you said was... Acknowledge the terror. Okay? That's the very first thing. And, this, and the second thing is... Um, your beliefs or justifications or ways to get away from your terror. Beliefs and methods used... To avoid terror. And remember it's to avoid the experience of of terror. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. So what we're doing here is we're being honest with ourselves about the techniques and the belief systems that we have that cause us to avoid our terror. Now, for the majority of us, we have these very strong belief systems that, that, that are very much surrounding the feeling of terror. In other words, we, we say we shouldn't have to feel terror. We, you know, we shouldn't have to feel fear. Other people, the person who hurt me should have to feel it. And this is why some people even revert to violence against the person who hurt them, because they want the person who hurt them to feel as bad as they feel, right? But uh, all of that doesn't help you heal any of the abuse. No. And this, by the way, this applies to both sexual and other forms of abuse. So violent abuse, for example, it also applies to, right? So it applies also. to all sorts of abuse. Obviously, when it's sexual in nature, there are additional issues that a person has to cope with that are not the same with violent abuse. Does that make sense? Um, but there are still large amounts of terror. Right? So you see many uh, men who are adults who have grown up with a violent father who was a drinker and come home drunk and beat up mum and beat up the kids and all those kind, that kind of scenario. You see many men who have grown up in that, although they weren't sexually abused by their father, they still will have this kind of terror in them. Does that make sense? And this kind of terror has to be released if you ever want to be free, if you ever want to feel a sense of freedom. Now, the only way to release terror is to feel it. Right? That, that's the problem. And, and in fact, what we did most of the time was we tried to avoid feeling it when we were children. And in fact, many times spirits who were guiding us at the time also tried to help you avoid it as well. And the main reason why they do that is because they try to help you. They try to help you not have as much trauma. Does that make sense? But unfortunately, it also causes, to a degree, this detunement thing that goes on, where we don't remember certain things about the abuse. We remember it beginning and it ending, but we don't remember much in between. Many times, and the reason why we don't remember much in between a lot of the times is because we, we're out of body already by that time, and so. Um, and in a safe location sort of thing, and, and, the, and the problems were just happening to our body at that point. 
So we need to understand that um, the memories of both violent and sexual abuse are not going to be as defined as your normal memories. Okay. Right? So this is something that you need to be aware of when you've been abused as well. They're not going to be as defined because you wanted to get away from them while they were occurring. And many times you were assisted to get away from them by spirits and, uh, and people who wanted to come to your rescue. Does that make sense? Spirit people who wanted to come to your rescue. And not all of them were people who were trying to help you, by the way. They're just people often who were in the same position as yourself when they were on Earth and they're trying to avoid their stuff as much as what they're trying to help you avoid yours. Yeah. All right, so, yeah. Now, so acknowledge the terror. So this is number one. Most people who have been abused barely do that. All right? And what are the beliefs and methods you use to avoid the terror? Most people are so much automated in, that, in this space that, that they're not even really conscious of what they do. Yeah. To avoid the terror. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's only been a process that I'm discovering now. You know, I've been shut, like I've actually felt terror, well, the big anxiety in my body for the first time in the last couple of months, you know, before that, I was gone before that was even allowed. Yes. And so, now it's like, all right, it's a sign. Yep. So allow yourself now, and if it was me, I most see, most people who've been abused don't want to take active don't want to do something positively and directly towards fixing the abuse. Yeah, what they want to do instead is avoid it. Yeah. Avoid the knowledge of it, avoid the <coughs> fact that it happened, avoid the... And there's a big fear that they might re-experience a whole heap of things that they don't want to experience and so forth, which is not really possible because you're an adult now and the, most of the abuse usually occurred during childhood. So it's not really possible to re-experience something as an adult that you had experienced as a child. All you can do is really remember it yeah. from an emotional perspective. But, but we tell ourselves that oh, I'm going to reinfect myself with the past. I'm, or we tell ourselves I'm over the past. <laughs> right? But every single day shows you you're not over the <laughs> past, but you're over it, right? Yeah. And, and so we, this, this is where we've got to be very, again, very sincere with ourselves about what we actually do now, right? Now, number three is to remember... ..that it is, it is an act of love <laughs> towards yourself... to feel your own feelings. Does everyone get what I mean by that? Yes. Yeah. So, so whenever we tell ourselves, I shouldn't have to feel that, you're really in that moment engaged in telling yourself a false thing about love of self. Because love of self really says... Whatever is in me, if I love myself, I'll feel it. I'll honour that that was my experience. See, for many people who have been either violently or sexually abused, they want to forget those parts of their life. The problem with forgetting those parts of their life is that they are actually now forgetting lots of things that have formed their current life. So, so you're sort of running away from who, you know, what has been a part of forming you as you currently are. Now, if you love yourself, you wouldn't do that. You would honour that. Does that make sense? Is there a second moving mic? Because I'd like to keep the mic with Eloisa, who I'm answering the question, and maybe just get out a second one, and we can just get comments from other people. Keep the mic with you, Eloisa. We'll come down to Matty, Matt down here. And we'll just... Hi, AJ. With... That number three, sometimes I get this feeling of like, I, I guess it happened at, the, at, at those kind of events of like, don't you dare feel those things. Yeah, no, that spirit, that's not your feelings. That spirit's with you. Yeah. And spirit, the problem is, is it's so easy for spirits with you to tell you not to feel things. 
because you don't want to feel them. No, I don't. So, so, so and a spirit who's a pedophile just comes along and says, you, don't you dare feel it. I'm going to make your life hard if you feel it. And you go, okay. Yeah. It's like having a mate who's next to you saying, don't feel. And you go, yeah, no worries, because you don't want to feel anyway. Not really, no. So that, that only happens because of the lack of will to feel. Does that make sense? That's my problem. That's the problem. The problem is that you don't see feeling these emotions as an act of love towards yourself. You see it as a chore, as, a, you know, as something to avoid. And to be honest with you, most people who have experienced any form of abuse feel the same way. They feel that it's just something they should avoid. Does that make sense? I think what I, I'm guessing it probably happens a lot for other people who've experienced abuse is then they, they bounce from one to the next to the next to the next to the next and like I'll realise, oh, I'm eating just to avoid. And then five minutes later I'm thinking about something else to avoid, avoid, avoid. And it gets so tiring and it's so unfulfilling and I, and I hate doing it but I love doing it at the same time. Well, you love doing it because you want to avoid yeah. this one emotion. Yes. So all of these techniques are techniques that you've learned mm. and you now purposefully use to avoid that one emotion. Why do I want to avoid it so much though? Like... Well, that's the question you need to ask yourself. And what I'm yeah. saying to you is partly it's because of your beliefs about feeling it. So part of the beliefs, remember part of the beliefs we talked about with Eloise were beliefs such as, I didn't abuse myself, somebody abused me, they should have to feel what I feel. They should have to do the work, not me. They should be punished first. Why aren't they being punished? And we even get things angry with God. Why hasn't God punished them for doing what, for doing what they chose to do? Rather than me having to feel it. It feels like I'm the one getting punished. Now, all of these belief systems are supportive to you not feeling your terror. They're all, so, so, and they're also not necessarily true, many of them. So, for example, a person who's a pedophile, when they arrive in the spirit world, because most of the time they don't cure it while on earth, they arrive in the spirit world, they, they are in some of the darkest places you can imagine and they stay there for thousands of years because of what they did, many of them, right? So, so you thinking that God hasn't done anything about it is not true either. There's, all of God's laws are trying to correct them as well. So, so a lot of the times we believe certain things about the universe and about God and about ourselves that are all not true. Like the belief that you're not capable of experiencing terror is not true. Like I can say that because I've had to go through all of these issues of abuse myself and, you know, I was tortured in the first century and I have all the memories about that, which is like, and I was sexually as well as violently tortured in the first century. So I had to go through all the memories about that, right? So, and, and I've been able to go through them all by choosing to do these things. I've gone to um, some, as I've said in other talks, I've gone to some um, things like advocates of childhood sexual abuse survivors, you know, and things like that. And sometimes I've gone to those kind of meetings for years. And what I found was the majority of them do not want to do this. And that's why they never heal. And I've known of people who... Uh, well, there's one person, 10 years later I visited him after seeing, meeting him 10 years prior. 10 years later I visited him and he was no different. He'd been going to a psychologist for 10 years and he'd be going to these meetings for a, a childhood abuse for 10 years and after 10 years he was no different than when I first met him. He had exactly the same problems his life was exactly the same. He had exactly the same issues emotionally. He had exactly the same attractions. And, and 10 years later, and, and he thinks that he'd been doing all that work, but he hadn't been doing this. <laughs> right? That's the big problem. Yeah. If you just pass your mic straight back. Um, can we use grief as the um, excuse for avoiding the terror as well? We can go straight into the tears and the, and the grief, but not actually feel the terror? I think you can, certainly. Um, of course, the grief won't be associated generally with the experience a lot of the times. A lot of times the grief will be associated with things like rebelling against the experience. Does that make sense? Like, in other words, 
we're basically having a tantrum about having to feel the feelings rather than feel the feelings themselves. Right? And this is very hard for a person who's been abused because there is this very strong feeling in them that somebody else did it to them, so somebody else should have to pay. Right? That's the feeling. And that's the feeling that usually drives the avoidance. The fact that somebody else should have to do it, somebody else should have to pay, rather than you do it yourself. So the grief is actually the tantrum? Oftentimes the grief can be the tantrum. Uh -huh. Particularly if you haven't felt some of the fear yet. Yeah. It often is the yeah. tantrum. Because it's like an um, incredible um, opportunity to just skip the terror and get into the grief. Exactly. But while the terror remains in you, your attractions will s remain. Yeah. Your life will keep attracting the same kind of events, particularly if it's a sexual abuse, then it will attract similar events sexually. If it's violent physical abuse, it will attract certain events physically. And it, this will be showing you that nothing much has really changed. Um, many people, of course, choose to make a comfortable life in that place. So what they do is they construct their life in such a way that they get to not have a partner because having a partner is too traumatic sexually. They get to not have uh, any interactions with any person who might have any effect on them um, in terms of helping them remember the violence or the sexual violence that has occurred to them. And, and so what they finished up doing is creating a very constrained life. Last week I called it making your own prison and then thinking that you're, in a sa you're safe, right? Uh, but it's actually a prison, you know, that's constraining you. And that's what most people who have been abused physically finish up doing in their life. So this is why many of them end up alone or they end up with a person who's uh, in, a, in a relationship with other people who are either who are either like what you would call abusive sexually or completely uninterested sexually. In, a, in other words, it's very rare to have a, a, a pure loving sexual relationship if a person's been sexually abused. And the reason why is because we don't want to get into certain emotions. It always comes down to that. that makes sense? So uh, there's more points I want to raise here, but if we can see that we need to... Firstly, acknowledge that the terror exists. And if you have had a violent childhood where your parent, one or both parents were violent at any time, there will be terror in you. It's, un it's unavoidable, actually. There will be terror in you. The majority of the times it was shut down from expression. In other words, you weren't allowed to express it at the time. Right? And because the, they just got more violent. You know, if you, if you expressed it at the time, they just get more violent or, you know, do more things to you. And then, of course, it just feels more frightening. And so what you learn to do is to not experience it, to not, not feel it, right? This is the problem. So we now acknowledge that the terror must exist. Even, and this is something we need to bear in mind. If, if we've had a, like a father that was just getting drunk every night, coming home, beating up mum, you've got to at some point even intellectually acknowledge that you must have terror in you. Because <laughs> it, it, it can have no other effect on you than cause some terror within you. Right? So we acknowledge that. Then what we do is we start examining and be sincere in our examination of what are the belief systems we have and what are the methods we use to avoid the experience of that emotion. Right? And that ranges from belief systems right from one kind of belief system which are all like, it's all their fault, I hate them, they've got, they've got to fix it, I'm never going to deal with it, they're going to have to deal with it first, they're going to have to come and apologise to me. But even if they came and was, were totally sorry for what they'd done, the emotion would still be in you. That's the sad thing about this. Because the, the emotions that are not felt stay within you. And that's the problem. And it's the emotions that stay within you that cause the damage to the rest of your life. So, so if you love yourself, bring coming to the third point, if you love yourself, you must choose to feel these emotions at some point. Right? Now, can you see that if you chose to feel the emotions, you would not revert to getting out of your body and having spirits come in. You wouldn't revert to... Me these methods and belief systems that you choose to avoid. Right? 
So, so whenever you, like you said, Matt, earlier, you go from one to the next to the next to the next to the next and then back to the beginning when all the others have failed <laughs> and cycle through all of these methods of avoidance, right? And it just feels like a cat chasing its tail sort of thing. Or a dog, I suppose. I've never seen a cat do it, but um, <laughs> chasing its tail. And, and that's how we often... And then after years of that, and mo most of people who have been abused have had years of that. Um, and so... Most of their life has ended up just this never-ending cycle of avoidance. Right? Now, the problem with a lot of therapy with abuse is that it also helps you in some methods of avoidance. So one method of avoidance is to tell your story without feeling your feelings. And many people who have, abuse, have had abused pasts often get into this addictive process of telling their story about the abuse without feeling the feelings associated with the abuse. Yeah. And so sometimes we'll go along to a, um, you know, some kind of a therapist and, and you'll be talking to them about your abuse and, and there's not a tear, <laughs> there's, not, <laughs> there's no fear, there's no terror, there's, I'm, this has just happened to me, I know it's happened to me, this is what happened. And they're trying, the, the therapist initially might be trying to help you get into the emotions of it, feel, to feel about it. But often the avoidance of the terror is the thing that, which is the doorway into you know, all, all the other emotions. The terror is the doorway into all the other emotions, the grief and other emotions associated with the... And even a lot of the anger associated with the event will be blocked by the terror. And yet... We don't see it like that. We sort, of, we sort of see it as the thing to avoid. So, so unfortunately, we have a tendency then when, we're, when we've been abused to avoid any emotional expression regarding the abuse. If we can't manage that, the other thing that we do is not talk about it at all. So we avoid both things. We also generally, depending on the type of abuse, either avoid or engage promiscuously in sexual acts that the abuse was also, uh, was also engaged in. So, so the abuser was also engaged in with us. In other words, we feel turned on by things that the, that the abuser did or we feel totally repelled by anything that the abuser did. Does that make sense? Yeah. And again, we're avoiding the terror of acknowledging those feelings. Right. So you can see straight away that if we did the first three things, we'd already have been progressed, Is that, wouldn't you, into dealing with quite a lot already, if we just come across to... Philippa? AJ, just on um, number three, mm -hmm. our lack of will to feel feelings... That's directly related to our lack of love for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Always. Yeah. Yes. What drove the question, Philippa? My lack of will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you if you really love yourself, you will want to get rid of from yourself any emotion that is harming your life. And in our childhoods, many of us have had many emotions that were stored through a process of events that our, of what our, you know, the environment took. So, so, for example, we started to cry, but the parents said, I'm going to give you something to cry about now. And you get so afraid, so you stop crying. Now that crying, that tear, those tears have been shut down. That, those tears will have to be experienced at some point in the future. They were there to be experienced. They're now locked down inside of you. They're like frozen emotion. And in fact, when those emotions come up, you will often feel the age of the emotion. So, for example, you might start crying and, and it feels like you're two years old crying. And that's, that's an emotion that you didn't feel when you were two years old that you needed to feel. That was shut down. Now, the average parent on the planet... Shuts down most of the child's emotion through, throughout of its life, right? That's, that's fairly normal. We, we often still see that as normal. And as a result of that, we learn to not feel anything. We, we're taught to not feel. But we need to see that it's an act of love towards ourselves to feel. 
to allow ourselves to feel what we actually feel. And if we're not willing to do it, then we're not willing to love ourselves. If we're not willing to love ourselves, it's going to be very hard to grow towards God because God wants you to love yourself. God wants to love you and God also wants you to love yourself. And if you're unwilling to love yourself, you're out of harmony with the way God sees you. Right? So it's going to be very hard to be at one with God while you're unwilling to love yourself. And part of being willing to love yourself is to remember that it's an act of love towards yourself to feel what you feel inside. That's an act of love towards yourself. That's what, partly what it means to love yourself. And in fact, it's a large part of what it means to love yourself. Yeah. So we just go straight across there. Hi. Um, you said feel your own feelings, but um, and I don't know if this is just I'm avoiding it, but I have gone, felt that like I was feeling my feelings and then all of a sudden I'm feeling somebody else's experience and I say, no, I'm not feeling that because that's not my experience. Should I still, even though I feel it's not my experience, that it's in me and I should just continue? Definitely not. <sighs> You've got to understand that every time you are feeling somebody else's experience, it's because you were choosing to not feel your own. Right. So at one stage, I've... Well, I felt like I was feeling my own feelings. And then all of a sudden it turned into someone else's yes. experience. Yes. Now, there was something in between those tra oh. that transition that occurred where you didn't want to feel oh, anymore. okay. There was that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I get you. Yes. And that, yes. that's what you've got to identify. What caused the switch between you feeling yourself and then you feeling someone else? Right. Does that make sense? Any hints on how to do that? <laughs> because I, it just seems like seamless. Well, yeah, we, it, often when we begin, it does seem seamless. Like it seems like, yeah. you know, it just happened. But it never just happens. Yeah. It always happens through a choice you make in your heart, the feeling yeah. in your feelings. So you might start feeling a certain thing. And I'll give you some clues as to what it could be. But... Uh, but I need you to feel about it because in the end, you've, you're the one who's got to be responsible for determining why you're trying to get away from your own feelings. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. But sometimes it's because we start feeling something, it feels like it's going to be too intense. Yes, yes. Right? And so in that moment, we're down terrified. So what do we do? We go into... F we're telling ourselves still, though, it's good to feel. It's good to feel. Yeah. yeah. But, but we've already just started avoiding our own feelings. Right. So who's going to come along and help us feel or feel something through us? Probably a spirit of some kind will come along, connect to us, feel something through us. That Just before we made that choice, that switch, we need to see what we did. It could be another belief, like it could be, I shouldn't have to feel this. Just that feeling, I shouldn't have to feel this. No. Causes me to attract somebody else feeling their stuff through me. Or it could be, I'm feeling this because... I know it's the only way to grow, so I have to do it. Yeah, have to do it. I have to do it. The attitude of I have to do it is always generally going to attract somebody else doing it through you. That's my big emotion. You, I have to do this. Yeah. yeah. You either want to or you don't. <laughs> Which one is it? <laughs> right? So for the majority of people who start to feel emotions regarding their childhood abuse, they feel a little bit and then it starts feeling a bit intense... And so then they don't feel like they want to. Here, in their heart, they don't feel like they want to. But they feel like they have to. So they try to force themselves now to feel something that they don't want to feel anymore rather than acknowledging they don't want to. <laughs> right? In that process, oftentimes a spirit will come, overcloak the person, and the spirit will feel its emotions through the person. It does no good to you at all. You can process for hours like that and you'll process nothing. And you'll just create a mess generally in your life if you to keep doing that, right? So that's not much good for you. What you need to do instead is you need to go, okay, stop. I can feel this is somebody else's emotion now. Stop. And then ask yourself, what happened just before the transition occurred? Just before the transition when you were feeling your own stuff and then you were feeling somebody else's. What happened in there? What caused that transition? A lot of times what causes it is we desire somebody else to feel with us. So we want people to share in our emotions with us. This is a big problem, actually, for many people who have been abused. 
They want people around them who have not been abused to understand their abuse. To be honest with you, if you've been abused, no one around you who has not been abused will ever understand what it feels like because they haven't experienced it. They're not going to understand. So, so it's impossible for them to understand what you've been through. So why are you trying to have them understand? Can you see that that has to be an addiction to have a sharing of the experience? A feeling that if you share the experience and they understand that they'll approve of it somehow or approve of you somehow. There's some addiction involved in that. And every time an addiction switches into play, you'll move from feeling your own feelings to sharing an experience with somebody else. Does that make sense? Yeah. And most people, it happens within the first five seconds of feeling. <laughs> They start being overwhelmed by a feeling and within five seconds later, they're already feeling someone else's feelings. Right? Because that's how strongly they want to avoid their own feelings. Right? Okay. Okay, if we bring it down to... Here, okay. Thank you. Um, each time I try to feel... Um, in my head, I have um, things about how about forgiveness, um, because I hate my parents, and, uh, and I tell how I feel about them, and then they they tricks me if any angles, and I feel like I should forgive them, and I'm not loving them at all. Um, <sighs> Can I talk about forgiveness as a separate subject okay. to this? Because while forgiveness needs to be part of the process that any person who's abused goes through, um, it can't actually be resolved unless you're prepared to go through some of these feelings. Yeah. So, so every time you try to jump ahead to forgiveness, there is going to be an issue. All right, so we need to talk about forgiveness and how forgiveness actually occurs as a separate issue um, to what we're talking about here, I feel. Is that okay with you? Yeah, so we'll talk Thank about... You. I'll just uh, write up there just to remind me. Oops. Spelling. It's always a problem. I'll just put that up there and we'll talk about that. Yep. Um, who is next? If we can we go up to assess at the back? And then we'll come down here. Um, I noticed that when Eloise was speaking and I started to feel myself, then I felt very afraid and realised all this um, projections that I got like what are you crying for? You've got no reason to cry. Shut up. And all of those things. Um, there's nothing happening. It's, you're not, it's not valid for you to cry. You, and all those judgments about me crying. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I need to feel that layer first. Yes. That sort of terror of that I've got nothing to cry about. Yeah, these and are And it's all the... denial that anything happened. Yeah, these are the beliefs and methods that we use to deny emotion. Right? So... Let's, if this wasn't fear we were talking about, it was some other emotion, acknowledge we have the emotion. Look at the beliefs and methods you use to avoid the experience of the emotion. All right? And then remember that it's an act of love towards yourself to feel your own emotions. Mm -hmm. So this, what I'm writing here applies not only to terror, but every single emotion you could ever experience. This is the process we need to go through for every single emotion. So in your case, you weren't allowed to cry. So feel about the methods that we use to shut you down and now that you use to shut yourself down, right, to avoid crying. Yeah, like the denial that was projected at me that there's nothing happened. It's nothing. Like, what are you crying about? It's yeah, nothing. nothing to cry Nothing's about. Nothing's been done. What's wrong? Yeah. I'll give you something to cry about if you keep crying. Those yeah. kind of projections are all part of the reasons why you avoid the experience now. Yeah, that so sense. that remembering that it's an act of love to yourself, that, that just struck me so powerfully. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 
when you truly feel that it's an act of love towards yourself, you will have very little resistance to your own emotion. So, what, so all of us who feel stuck at different times to our own emotion, most of the time we're stuck because we don't believe that. We believe it's an act of love to avoid the emotion. We believe the complete opposite. We believe that it's loving to ourselves to avoid our terror. It's loving to ourselves to avoid our grief. And this is why most people spend a lot of their life avoiding all of their emotion. Does that make sense? And it's very important we understand this, that this love of self actually is partly and, and a lot about feeling yourself. You've got to feel yourself to love yourself. And that means you need to feel your own emotion to love yourself. And every time you avoid feeling your own emotion, you're not loving yourself. And it doesn't matter what the emotion is, whether it's terror, shame, happiness, joy, sexual pleasure, sexual shame... It doesn't matter which direction the emotion is, whether it's what we view as a positive emotion or as a negative emotion, if it's in us, we need to feel it. If we don't feel it, then we're not loving ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. If you bring across to here and then down to here. Discuss there. Hi, I um, went from the extremes yeah. <laughs> of wanting to get out and then detune totally so yeah. that I could do the... Which are two of the methods <laughs> that you use. And really, I mean, Dad was born in 1939 in England. There were bombs being exploded around him. Yep. He was terrified right from zero. And well, his parents would have been terrified as well. Yep, mm. Grandpa was pulling them out of rubble, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And he was really shut down and very, very fearful and I carried that into conception. Mm -hmm. And so I don't even know how much feelings, how many feelings I've ever felt that were my own. Uh, be careful now because you're basically saying that your dad's terror that he had while you were growing up or after you were conceived is not your own emotion. But his feelings did enter you. So the terror exists within you now because he didn't release it from himself. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this is your emotion. But I'm wondering about how many spirits have overcloaked me right from the beginning because of his fear and... The problem with spirits overcloaking you isn't about his fear. It's okay. about your desire to avoid the fear. And there's a lot of self-loathing as well that... I've just become aware of because I didn't even yep. know about the abuse until July. Yeah, but you also choose to avoid the feeling of self-loathing, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> which also then attracts spirits to come to you. Yeah. Every time you choose to avoid emotion, you will, you will attract some spirits every time. So in the, like I ask, uh, I mean, I'm trying my best to connect with God and yeah. a celestial being that they may assist me in feeling an emotion or showing me why I don't want to feel the emotion in that moment of time. You know, I mean, I've, I've just detuned for so long, gone with a power struggle, you know, yeah. cancer then is about to kill me and yeah. it's like I've really got to do something about this. The eight-year-old stuff came through. Yeah. But if you examine even that, the desire for other people to help you is still not a choice to feel your own emotion. Mm. Mm. So Avoiding. It's still wanting someone else to be involved in the process. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, there's a difference between that and actually trusting that God's with you when you're feeling your own emotion. The fact that you want someone to share the process with yeah. you is actually a primary cause of cancer. Do you understand? Yeah. The, you want somebody else to be involved in it with you. Is, is a lot of the, 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 these are projections that come out of people generally who get cancer, and there's an anger towards anybody who doesn't get involved in it with you. And the anger's so huge because spirits just get in, and I've been locked up for that, you know. And it's yeah, but it's not the spirit's fault that your anger is so huge. No, it's my responsibility. No, but that's not how you say it when you talk about it. <laughs> you see, it's all uh, these feelings are in you. Yeah. And, and while you're trying to avoid them, you will create many circumstances and situations which, are like, which you feel are justifiable, but they're not. They, they are your avoidance of the issue. Yeah. And whenever you get extreme anger to such a point that someone's got to constrain you, it's, a, it's an indication of how much you wish to blame other people rather than just feel something. And in those places, certainly spirits will come and overcloak you. 
but, but it wouldn't happen if you loved yourself to f enough to feel your own feelings. Does that make sense? So we need to at some point make this choice to see that, that it's about every time I choose to avoid, I am going to have spirits come to me. I'm going to be yelling and screaming at other people. I'm going to act in a crazy manner. I might even lose my mind. I'm, all these things might happen, right? If I choose to avoid. Yeah. They can only happen if I choose to avoid, actually. And they will happen. And they will happen. They have happened yeah, because of course. I've avoided. So exactly. Much, and I don't. So the key is to choose differently. That's why I'm here. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's a start. It's a start, but, it's a start. but you find it difficult to, to, very difficult to listen. And one reason why you find it difficult to listen is because there is already this feeling in you that I want other people to share my experience with me. And that's one of the emotions, one of the belief and methods that you're using to get away from your own experience. It used to be my identity to talk about this incident and that incident, and and I and I do my best not to go into what has come up more recently. Yep. So I don't want I, that is that is part of my identity, but I don't want people to know about it as much as I used to. So well, the reality still... is, it's not a part of your identity. It's a part of the mud that's been thrown yes, at you, and correct. that's not your identity. No, no I realise <laughs> a bit more about that now. But many people who have been abused see it as a part of their identity. It's almost like a mark of um, their personality. They view it as a part of their personality. It's not a part of your personality either, by the way. Abuse is not a part of your personality. It's something that's been thrown at you that you've, had, you've gone through an experience of. It, it, it doesn't mean that your real personality that God created is ever going to have in the future that part of it attached to you. In other words, the abuse is just something that happened to you, an experience that happened to you. It is not who you are. I've, done a, I've looked at the soul and the information you provided and I've found it very helpful yep. just in conceptualising and doing my best to feel at a heart level. Yeah. There's a long way to go. So if, if the abuse is not who you are, then can you see if you release the abuse as an experience emotionally, it will no longer define who you are. And while you're telling the stories about the abuse to other people, you're still believing that it defines who you are. Yeah. Does that make sense? I can see and that. And it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. It only defines what happened to you. And usually not even what you wanted to happen to you. I didn't even know it happened. You didn't, often so we don't, well, we do always know, but, but often it's things that we weren't aware of in our later life because of denial. We won't even acknowledge what happened. And then we don't want to acknowledge what we do to control what happened. And then, of course, we feel that we, it's an act of love to not feel it rather than feel it. Mm -hmm. And because we have these basic belief systems, we don't finish up we don't finish up processing through any of it, yeah. right? Yeah, it's the hardest thing ever to go and process. It is, but you also need to be careful that you don't wear that as a badge <laughs> as well. Does that make sense? In other words, say, you haven't been sexually abused, you haven't been violently abused, you don't know how bad it is for me. <laughs> you know, and, and we've got to be very careful we don't use that as a badge, which is one of the methods we're using to avoid our personal experience of it. Does that make sense? Yes. So we've got to take care almost uh, like what I notice a lot of people who have been violently or sexually abused doing is they're constantly, constantly coming up with all these statements that almost every statement needs to be challenged because every one of them is not in harmony with the truth about the situation. Yeah, trying to feel special and worthy and all yeah, that Yeah, there are many people stuff. who have been abused who feel that it's a special badge. Well, I don't want and it's, and, and it's not, it's a terrible thing to have had happen, but it's not a badge that's going to define the rest of your existence. Yeah. Thank if you. Thank we can you. Come down here. Uh, if we use the mic if, so that everyone can hear, <laughs> and you'll have to hold it up quite straight for you. Thanks. Um, uh, I, I um, believe I have not uh, taken responsibility for my life for the past 50 years, and possibly a lot more than that. And um, um, can I just stop you? Is that mic working? Yeah. It is? Oh, okay. If you just put it like this towards you, so I can right. hear you properly, everyone's not going to hear okay. you. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, and I um, uh, prayed to God to, to, to show me just uh, um, uh, how, I, uh, how I can uh, take uh, responsibility and 
uh, for, for where I am in, in, in my life. Um, and I, I woke up this morning and I was just in complete fear. Uh, and uh, I think I just don't want to express... Because I haven't expressed myself in my, in my life, yeah. um, I've allowed others to do it, do it for me, yeah. kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, uh, not really sure <laughs> just where I want to go with this. But when you say um, you woke up this morning in fear, mm. do you know what the fear is about? Is it primarily about having to say or speak up? Well, okay. that, that's, uh, yes, that, yes, yes, that, that, that's one of them and takes me back to um, childhood. I suppose my uh, uh, f- father m- mentally abusing my, my mother and being told not to, to say anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, yes, but in my um, marriage, not, not, not speaking up yep. a- at all. Yep. Um, and uh, st- still not speaking up. Yep, that's okay. <laughs> Can I? I'm not saying it's okay for you to <laughs> forever to do that. But what I'm saying is, I understand. And um, can I just make a few suggestions yes, for, for you? Please. Whenever we are, whenever we are being quiet, generally, and we're not expressing our personality naturally, generally it's because of fear. Now, fear ranges from a mild um, feeling of oh, I just have a little uh, bit of. Uh, a bit of afraid of that type of feeling, right the way through into fe- deep fear, right the way into terrified, I'm terrified, and, I, and, I, and anywhere in between those, that range, you could say we have fear. Usually, we have a lot of fears that are associated with our emotional life. In other words, expressing ourselves as we truly are, is often, we're, we're often avoiding it because of a lot of reasons. Most of the time it's because we're afraid of what other people will do with it once they know what we really feel. We're also afraid of public opinion or the opinion of the people who love us or or whom we believe love us. We're afraid that the people who love us may not love us anymore if they really knew what we actually felt about things. Or we're afraid that our personal circumstances will change substantially if we're truthful, if we openly express what we really feel. These are all quite deep fears, actually, for most people. And, and I, like I, I feel every time a person doesn't express themselves openly and honestly, there is usually a number of those fears present in their life. And the key is acknowledging that it's there and then looking at how, what you do to avoid it. And one of the things that you've been doing to avoid it is to not speak up. Yes. Does that make sense? Like, yes, yes, like you, when you don't speak up, you get to avoid how terrified you are when you're actually speaking up. Yes. And, you, and in particular, how terrified you are when you're actually speaking up and saying exactly what you feel. Because that, that then just leaves everybody around you going, well, now, now they are all going to potentially make choices and decisions based on what you just said. And who knows what will happen? You want to say? Um, uh, I, can't, I really can't, can't kind of put it into words. Am I overcloaked by spirits in not wanting to, to, uh, to say or not wanting to, to listen? No, what happens to you is um, you are so afraid of speaking up that the spirits around you at times just force you to close down, and it's really quite easy to force you to close down. It's quite, from a spirit's perspective, all they have to do is just threaten you a little bit with some potential feeling, and, and you will automatically close down yourself. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So you're not heavily overcloaked by spirits, but you're attracting spirits to you who want to control you, and, and because you're so afraid of speaking up, this is one of the main reasons how they control you. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. I, I feel I know exactly what I want to say, but it just won't... Won't come out of you. It won't, it just yeah. won't, won't, won't come And out. do you find sometimes, too, the thoughts don't... You can feel what you want to say, but the thoughts don't get constructed in such a way that That's makes right. it clear to others? Yes, yeah. very, very much so. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that, yeah. that's an indication of how much fear you have about speaking up. 
So what I would do in those circumstances is I would look at my beliefs and my methods that I use to control that feeling, you know. Yes. And then I would actually remember that I need to feel some of these feelings. It's an act of love to myself and it's an act of love for, to myself to say what I feel and to feel what I feel. Uh -huh. yes. And it doesn't matter what the other people are going to do with that. And that's right. the area that's quite frightening for you. Yes. Well, yes. you're worried very much what they're going to do about it. Mm. Yeah. Yes, that's so. And there was also about soulmates yep. and about being married with uh, um, whether you live find out about here. Uh, Can I uh, put soulmate issue up there? And we'll raise that one once we've got over this issue. Is that all right? Because <laughs> there's quite a few in the room who'd like to talk about that subject too. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. And you, if we go back to Laura, thank you. Um, AJ, as, as little and young as I can remember, I've been a day, day, daydreamer. Mm -hmm. and, um, daydreaming, walking to school, in school, like all the time. Yeah. Um, so I completely understand jumping out of body when there's an, a something happening and I don't want to feel it. But in terms of not wanting to be in reality all the time, mm -hmm. um, sometimes with, when I connect with that I feel like a deep sadness but I don't know if it's a depression of a lot of other feelings. Um, so my question is being so little, this is far before the abuse and everything, just not wanting to be in reality. Mm -hmm. w what kind of emotions would be impacting, say, a three, four-year-old? Um, firstly, I cannot, I cannot agree that you can say that it was before the abuse, for a start. Uh, um, yes, sorry, I was thinking sexual abuse, but you, exactly. all the other abuse. Before a person is sexually abused, generally there are a number of other things occurring in the family that allow for the sexual abuse to occur. It's very rare for sexual abuse to be a one-off event. And in the families, usually um, the reason why it's only a one-off event in some instances is because it's not a family-based incident. It's an incident that came from outside of the family for some reason. Usually if abuse occurred within the family or, you know, within, from different members of the family, and I'm even talking here extended family like uncles, grandfathers and those kind of people, is because there is a, there's already an endemic problem inside of the family with regard to sexual issues and issues of violence and control. Does that make sense? And these particular issues create a fertile field for abuse to occur. Now, you would have already been attempting to get away from those kind of feelings before you know, any abuse would have occurred. Does that make sense? Now, many children don't get away because, because abuse often starts at two, three very young ages even before they've intellectually developed enough to know anything about how to get away. But for those people who have abuse that occurs after those ages, generally they've already been trying to get away from some things that are not going well inside of the family or in the extended family in terms of emotions that are coming at them that they're trying to avoid. Now, one method that children use quite substantially is the method of imagination to avoid living in real life. Right? Now, it becomes a coping mechanism when we're a child, generally. The problem now as an adult is the issue of how to reverse the, the issue, reverse the coping mechanism. So while the coping mechanism may have helped you survive as a child, it is certainly not helping you live as an adult. Does that make sense? I'm finding in the car, like I'll, start, like I'll think, and I'm like, am I present? And I'm like, wow, I'm just thinking or daydreaming and I'll have to blink and physically do things. Yep. So with what you were saying, Eloise, and now I've just got to really acknowledge that I don't want, even when there's nothing happening around me, it's a sunny day, it's all good, you know, I just don't want to be, to in, be, present. To be present in reality. Exactly. And obviously there's got to be a large amount of terror that would cause a person to not want to be present. Does that make sense? A desire to get away from reality is caused by something. It can't be just caused by nothing. So the question then is, looking at the beliefs, the beliefs and methods that you have for trying to avoid this emotion, which partly it's about you know, using your imagination and tuning out and zoning out and spacing out and avoiding 
connection, right, with yourself. So that's one of your primary methods. So you need to see that as a method that you're using that's not in harmony with love of yourself. Now, it might have been in harmony with love of yourself as a child because it might have been the only method that you had to cope. But now it's not a method that's going to help you live your life. Does that make sense? So, so my suggestion to you is to see that as a method that is no longer supporting your life. And every time you notice yourself doing it, ask yourself, what happened just before you did it? Try to remember what happened just before you did it. So every time you want to imagine something that's not real, look at what you were thinking about just before then. Just moments before. And, and as I was saying, when I do connect, like I, I just feel like I'm, I'm an eternally sad person. Like, and I think I, I don't know whether... Am I genuinely deeply sad or is that d depressing and depressing, like rage and like all these... Like is that just the icing on the cake or is this deep sadness a real feeling that's... You know, like I don't know if I'm... If, if it's the... Um, can you see what you're doing? You're trying to get a, an answer because I'm scared to feel yes. my terror. Yes. You, you don't want to discover for yourself what the emotion is that causes you to tune out and imagine all the time. So what you want is me to tell you. Mm -hmm. And even if I know, it's not going to help you, is it? No, I want to control it so I have some sort of roadmap on what's going on. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's not going to help you feel it. Is it? So, so I would be focusing on working through some of your belief systems about the choice to feel, the choice to be present, the choice to feel, and the choice to take personal responsibility for your feelings. You see, in your past, if you examine your past carefully, you'll see that you've always been looking for a guru. You've always been looking for someone to tell you your life or your experience. And the reason why you're doing that all the time is because you don't want to feel your own for yourself and take responsibility for your own feelings for yourself. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and this is a method that you use to avoid the feeling that is present. So if you, I'm told I can tick it off but never feel it. Exactly. And that doesn't help you at all. And it hasn't helped you if you think about it. You think about how many people have been willing to tell you heaps of things for your own good, as I've said, and you've gone along for the ride and in the end ended up in a worse position. You know, it's happened a number of times in your life, hasn't it? Yeah. So, so can you see that partly that's happened because you've wanted to not discover things for yourself? Yes. You've wanted to avoid the process of self-discovery and you want other people to tell you what you are. Now, un under those circumstances, you're very, very open to spirit influence. Because you'll just have a whole heap of spirits telling you what you are. You've got your mother telling you what you are, right? You've had your mother telling you what you are all your life, right? She's still trying to tell you what you are. Right? And you're completely open to that because you, you don't want to discover what you are for yourself yet. So my suggestion is that, yes, there is a lot of fear that's causing this desire to go into imagination, a desire to go into unreality to avoid reality. Thank yeah. you. And the way through it is to feel the fear. That's the way through it. I haven't heard that before. No. <laughs> no. Uh, I've saying the same, been saying the same thing to Mary for, for five years or six years now, and, and she says, I reckon you must have said that to me a thousand times in the time I've known you. And, uh, and still she struggles to get into the terror of it. And it's only recently that she started to get into the terror of things. Because you've got to want to do it. It can't be something that you feel like you have to do. It's got, you've got to want it. And that's where it's difficult because terror is the kind of emotion that most people never want to feel. Right? And at some point you've got to see that it's essential for your life to feel and that you, it's essential for you to know yourself and to feel yourself, to feel these emotions. The problem with terror as well is that 
it has this other effect, and that is it has the effect of suppressing most of the other emotions. So many people try to experience joy, but you never can fully experience joy while the terror is present. They try to experience pleasure, but you can never fully experience pleasure while terror is present. And so then they need substances to help them feel joy and pleasure. And even then it's never fulfilling because while the terror is present, you will never be able to feel everything else beautifully or perfectly. So all these beautiful emotions you may have, love, joy, peace, all those lovely emotions that you may experience, you won't ever be able to experience while the terror remains in you. So it's really important for your own happiness to address the terror. Does that make sense? And it's really important that you stop using techniques, these beliefs and methods that you've been using to get away from it, that you stop doing that now. You're an adult now. You're capable of going through the experience. If the child went through the experience, then you as an adult are totally capable of remembering it. Right? And in fact, in some ways, it's honouring the child that was yourself by remembering it, isn't it? Rather than denying it. You're honouring yourself if you remember it. You'll get to the point where you remember it and there's no more emotion left about the, rem the memory of it. But it requires that you go through some of these steps first. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Is there any more questions about the terror or any emotion and, and this process of feeling it? We can add some more things to the list, but actually if we started with those three things, we could see that in a few months we might be ready for another thing to do after that. But to do those things often takes months of our life, but my suggestion is do it. Take the months of your life to do it. Because, it, because without doing it, nothing is going to change in the long term in your life. So take take the time to do it. Yeah. If we come down to it Can I leave it on the board? Yeah. Probably not. Manny? I can unscrew these. Oh, this one here, I see. Yeah, gotcha. Can I just suggest uh, a few things about self responsibility before we proceed with the issues of forgiveness? And soulmates. <coughs> we have a we have often large desires within us to avoid self responsibility, and frequently we we have no idea what we're doing with regard to taking responsibility. And yet taking responsibility for yourself is one of the primary lessons to learn on earth. That no one else is responsible for your welfare. Right. Now, many times we want other people to be responsible for our welfare. And that in itself is not a way to grow. Because you're totally then totally reliant on somebody else sharing in your growth with you. So if you want to share responsibility with others with regard to your personal growth, what you're going to finish up doing is placing your personal growth in somebody else's hands. And that's never a wise thing to do. What you want to do instead is have total self-responsibility and know that everything with regard to your own growth is in your hands. That you have the power to change your life and you don't need any other individual on this planet to help you change your life. Now, you, you think about it. If you felt that way, how much you would be focused upon fixing up problems from the past. You could see that you'd have a fairly high focus, wouldn't you, if you felt that way. But when we engage other people in assisting us, 
And I'm not saying that we can't do that. I'm just saying that when we do, we are actually in some ways trying to disclaim some personal responsibility for our feelings and emotions. So the reality is we can get help from other people and you can, either, you can both ask for it and receive it without even asking for it. However, if you want it before you progress, then it's highly unlikely you will ever get the assistance you need. And the reason why is because there's no real desire inside of yourself to progress under those circumstances. So if I can just clarify what I've just said. Self-responsibility is one of the lessons... Is it an A or an A? Self-responsibility is one of the lessons that God is trying to teach you with regard to your earth life. Every time you share responsibility of your life with somebody else, you are avoiding self-responsibility, the lessons of self-responsibility. Now, they may choose to give you the gift of something, the gift of knowledge or the gift of an experience or the gift of even cooking a meal for you or the gift of something. That is a gift. That is not something that you can demand of someone. When we are completely self-responsible, we will find that we have no demands of other people. And when you have no demands of other people, you only see what other people do for you as a gift. And you don't expect it. Right? So when we take full self-responsibility, we see the gifts from others rather than seeing them um, expectations or demands. So if I went to a seminar of any kind, I'd bring a notebook. <laughs> Do you know why? Because I would see that just being able to attend is a gift. And my ability to absorb what material is given will depend on a number of factors, some of which are going to be that I may not absorb the material that I, and so I need to write it down. And I would choose to do that. Right? And I would see it as a gift, in fact, and an appreciation of the gift of doing, of doing that. I wouldn't expect it to be televised. I wouldn't expect it to be recorded. But I would see if the person did that as a gift as well. <laughs> Does that make sense? Now, the reason why I raise that with you is that sometimes we don't realise that the... Because we're expecting all of these things to be given to us, we're no longer seeing them as gifts. We're actually having an expectation for them. When you have an expectation for something, you can't learn. You can't. Because it's not a desire anymore or, an ex or a gift. It's an expectation or demand. You're closed to the gift under those circumstances. You don't learn generally under those circumstances. And you certainly don't retain the information under those circumstances generally. Now, when it comes to issues like, if you think about the issue I raised at the beginning of the talk so far, with, or that you raised with me, which was, so Teresa raised the issue of financial responsibility. That's about self-responsibility. The issue that Eloise raised about what's happening when I'm tuning out, when I'm zoned out, that's actually about self-responsibility, if you think about it. An emotion that I have within myself that I'm refusing to feel means that I'm not taking responsibility for my emotions. That's an issue of self-responsibility too. Can you see? 
And so even Maddie asking me to turn the board around is, a, is an issue of self-responsibility. Does that make sense? And what I'm trying to illustrate to you is frequently we want other people to take responsibility for what we know actually is a part of our personal life. And if we do this all the time, we can't finish up having a relationship with, with anyone that's, that's any good, let alone with God. Right? Well, God wants you to be able to use your will in such a self-expressive way that you are totally responsible for every single thing you create. And if you look at all of the pain and suffering that's occurring on the world today, can you see that most of it is caused because none of us really want to take responsibility for what we create? So the average person who eats meat doesn't want to take responsibility for the destruction of the Amazon. In fact, I know many meat eaters who condemn the destruction of the Amazon, but the Amazon is being destroyed to provide more meat. <laughs> There's a direct correlation between those two things. How many women with rings on their fingers don't want to take responsibility for blood diamonds? Isn't it the same thing? We often don't see how areas where we're not taking responsibility are affecting everyone else around the world. And we sort of see it as, oh, that's happening over there. You know? Rather than seeing it as... What am I doing in my personal life that's not taking responsibility that causes these events to happen over there? And that, that's something we need to reflect upon. Once we are taking full self-responsibility for everything in our life, we, we will be very, very close to God, but also we'll be very appreciative of every gift we receive. We will have a feeling of just love and joy for the fact that we're receiving these gifts rather than an expectation and demand that we keep receiving. And we will take action on everything we receive, generally, under those circumstances. Yeah. You want to raise something, Laura? Yeah. I was just going to say, with all the talks that you've done and all the material that you've presented... Um, people constantly, the same people coming back and coming back, is that the same um, demand of more information, more information when we're not taking any personal responsibility of actually doing the work but we just want more and more of... of is it the same, t same demand and expectation from you to keep saying the same things over and over for years and years and years? Often it is, isn't it, if you think about it? Um, of course I do present new material. We present a lot of new material, material that we haven't presented before. But we're often, whenever we're going, going into question and answer sessions generally, we're often asked exactly the same questions over and over and over and over again. Why is that? There's only two reasons why we do that. Do well, we what? just want to be told and want all the answers intellectually but not do any work on our own. I agree, but I don't think that's the reason why we do it necessarily. I think that's the effect of it. Yeah. Um, we don't want to take personal responsibility. We don't want to fear. We don't want to love ourselves enough to. Fear. Yeah, we don't want to feel our own feelings. We want somebody else to do it all for us. Yeah. Like you, you want a saviour. Many of you. Mm. you do yeah. you want a saviour? You want. Let's define saviour. You don't want somebody who comes along and tells you how to save yourself. You want somebody who comes along and saves you from yourself. But what we, we're not all, of, you know, what I'm not understanding is that if I took the self responsibility that, and I actually did the work, then we'd actually get new information and we'd actually be able to progress instead of staying on the same level for years and years. Like we'd actually be able to find new things and expand and I agree. learn a lot more. But not, the way God's that. universe is being constructed, if you choose to not feel, you're not going to discover much. No. So we're choosing to not progress. That's correct. That's correct. And you're choosing... What you're waiting for is a cult leader who comes and saves you. That's, By hearing enough information, eventually... And then you end up with you. Jesus and he doesn't save you at all. 
So we've all got a really... I mean, this is, this is a big issue then for everybody that's listening. It is a big issue for everyone that's listening, Laura, yep. Many, many people want somebody else to do the work for them. But you see, the way God is with you is God wants and knows that only you can have your relationship with God, only you can have your relationship with your, yourself, and only you can have your relationship with your soulmate. Nobody else can do that, any of those things for you. Right? Only you can feel your own love. Nobody else can feel your love unless you have it inside of you. Right? First. And so we need to start seeing that we are, in fact, our own saviours. That's awesome. Yeah. It, it's awesome, but for most people, that's not what they want to hear. <laughs> you know, and th why do you think the Christian faith became so popular? Because of this reason. It was based on one fundamental principle, which was false, and that was that somebody would be able to come along and wipe away all of your problems at some point. And we do nothing. And you don't have to do anything for it but believe. Right? And of course, while that might sound attractive, and, it's been, and it has sounded attractive to one and a half billion people currently on the planet, so we're talking like one-fifth of the world's population currently, it's very, very attractive to believe that. But why is it so attractive? Because they all want a saviour, someone who comes along and saves them from their life. Now, God constructed a universe where we construct our own life. So how could God send a saviour when God constructed the universe to be like it is, where we construct our own life? Now, when I say we, I mean collective we and individual we. Right? Collective we in that the choices and decisions we make together will have an effect, not only here, but everywhere else in the world, depending on what we choose to do. It will have a negative effect if we act out of harmony with love, it will have a positive effect if we act in harmony with love. In our personal life, the choices we personally make ourselves, individually, will have an effect on what we attract in our personal life. This is the issue of self-responsibility. No one else can save you. The only thing that can save you is love, <laughs> is, is us learning how to love. That's the only thing that can really save us. Right? And there's two forms of that love. One is the love that you have, that you develop within you, and the other form of love is the love that God has, that God's willing to give you. Now those two loves can save you, but only by you taking some self-responsibility, doing it yourself. Nobody else can do it for you. So it doesn't matter how many talks you come along to listen to Jesus speak, he can't do it for you. Right? He can't do it for you. And sometimes I feel, like, I feel like saying to people, yes, I've heard this question before and I've answered it 25 times. <laughs> and there's actually 25 recordings of me answering it 25 <laughs> times. Why haven't you gone back to the recordings that have been provided to you for free to relook at some of these issues that you know you have an issue with. And partly it's because there is this other problem that we have, besides wanting a saviour, and that is we, we want a different answer. We want a different answer. Many times we ask the same question over and over again because we're not satisfied with the previous answer. All right. Now, if you look at our biggest problem, our biggest problem is we're not satisfied with the answer that you're going to have to feel for yourself. We're not satisfied with that answer. Why do you think all this New Age movement has grown so rapidly? It's all about not having to feel things for yourself. That you have some kind of presto transformation. 
and all of a sudden you're a spiritual guru. Isn't it about that? Ten steps and tips and strategies like seven steps to environment. Yeah. All, that. all these things, like they are all there because we don't want the more simple but more difficult answer, which is you're going to have to feel. What do you want? How do you feel? What are your desires? What are your wants? What are your attitudes about love? What are your attitudes about truth? What are your attitudes about faith, humility and other things? You're going to have to feel about all that. And it doesn't matter how much I talk. I can't make you feel. We're just not getting real with ourselves, are we? We're not stopping ourselves from continuing a process that we know now is just unlike... Like we're not... Some, some are. Uh, some, are. Know, some, some people are, are yeah. but, but most are not. Yeah. It's like what we would with a child. We wouldn't allow unloving behaviour. We're not stopping ourselves in the tracks and going, no, this is not on exactly. anymore. Exactly. Because uh, for the majority of us, we still want our addictions met. We still want... We don't want God's way of doing things. Right? We want our way of doing things. And unfortunately, because there's like six and a half or seven and a point two or something billion people on the planet now... There's 7.2 billion ways of doing things. <laughs> and of course, when 7.2 billion ways of doing things come together and collide, it's pretty messy. Right? Whereas if we all started accepting God's way of doing things, the way God created us to be and doing things God's way, which is the whole reason why in the first century we called what we taught, myself and Mary called what we taught, the way, we weren't talking about our way. We were talking about this is God's way of doing things. Unless I, at some point, through my will, exercise of my will and my responsibility and my desire, exercise God's way of doing things, no real positive change can occur. That's a reality. And yet we go, but give me another way, give me another way. Not understanding that God's way is the best as well. It's the fastest. It's the, it, it's the cleanest. It's the most effective. It's the most economical <laughs> way of doing everything. God's way is the best in so many, all of the different areas that we can think of. And yet we go, no, no, I don't like that. My idea would be better. And this is one of our major problems is that we don't take self-responsibility because we want another way. We want some kind of saviour to come along and save us from our own actions. Right? And it's not ever going to happen. Someone will come along and tell us how to save ourselves from our own actions. <laughs> that will certainly happen. There will be hundreds of thousands of millions of people who eventually will do that. But... At some point, we've got to take the actions ourselves. Yeah. So I wanted, to just ra I wanted to just raise that because it's a big issue, I feel, for many of us still. Like, if you think about how many... I think I've done... I think there's about 80 question and answers series, isn't there, in this, where people have asked all of these questions before, or most of them before. Now, I am very aware that we are ready at a certain time to hear certain information. That is definitely true. And when I say we're ready, it doesn't mean that some kind of universal uh, thing happened to make us ready. What happened was we got ourselves ready <laughs> to hear certain things. Right? And that is certainly true. We are ready at a certain time to hear certain things because we chose to get, our, get ourselves ready to hear it. Right? And so that's one reason why I share things over and over again, because sometimes I think, oh, I think there's more readiness to hear that now. And one thing I liked about our group last week was that there was a lot of readiness to hear certain things internally. Yep. That was a it was a lovely group because of that. There was a lot of readiness present. But to be truly ready, we've got to start to love ourselves, start taking action on what we've learned, start to really confront our own lifestyle, our own systems of belief. We've got to do a lot of personal work 
to to really understand the truth about ourselves, about our soulmates and about God. And many of us could be ready for that, but have chosen to want another answer. So I've, I've seen many people who have listened to this stuff that I've presented for years, sometimes five years, they've gone off on other tangents to do other things and I see them looking for their other answers. And I know at some point in the future they're going to look at all those other answers and think it was all a waste of time because there is only one way. God's way is the only way. Right? And it's not my way. I'm just, I'm just sharing with you what I've personally discovered. So it's not my way. It belongs to God. It was given to me through a process that God has me in just like God has you in. Yeah? And that's the way, the only way to, to grow, to change. And so choose it. The key is to choose it. Okay, what's the time, guys? Yeah, well, let's have a break now, shall we? And then I'll get on to those two subjects. Forgiveness and soulmates. <laughs>